Hi, I'm James Gurney, and welcome to History Infection Part 3, HIV. HIV is just like any other virus. It just wants to replicate itself, and its host of choice is us. More specifically, our T-cells and macrophages. But before we get into the nitty-gritty of the molecular biology on the subject, maybe some history might be useful. It's widely reported and believed that HIV began with a patient zero in the early 80s, maybe late 70s. A common story is that a homosexual Canadian airline attendant bought back HIV to Los Angeles and it spread throughout his community due to their promiscuous lifestyle. This story is largely wrong, not so much the fact that this patient didn't exist and these conditions never happened, they did, but it misses the point that HIV was actually around way before this event. HIV goes back before I, and more than likely you, were born. In fact, before we even knew really what a virus was. The first possible recorded case, that's the best we can do, was of a man named David Carr. It's claimed that David was never actually sexually active in Africa, and he died in the late 1950s of a bizarre collection of disorders and diseases. The first of these being PCP, which we'll get onto later. This is almost never seen outside someone who doesn't have a severely depleted immune system. He also had quite a pronounced skin lesion, which may have just been a rash, or it could have been an AIDS-related cancer. His death was tallied under, I don't know, until parts of his remaining lab samples were tested in the 1990s, where a paper suggested they actually found HIV within the samples, but this was later retracted in 1996 as they were unable to replicate the findings. Unlike good scientists, as they were unable to replicate the findings, they had to say they were unsure if he actually had HIV or not. So our story moves on to Avard Nor, a Swedish sailor who is known to have been sexually active in Africa as he caught gonorrhea while sailing there. Avard also had a similar progression of symptoms, and when his samples, his daughters and his wife, who all died of similar conditions, were tested in 1988, they were shown to be positive for HIV. This is a good 20 years before the supposed patient zero of the Canadian flight attendant. Genetic work looking at how much variation there is between HIV and its common ancestor has put its zoonotic event, where it jumped from species, back to around 1930. Typically, an HIV patient develops a range of diseases that you wouldn't normally see in healthy people. Healthy people sometimes go infected with bacteria and viruses, but these tend to be professional pathogens or something else getting in by mistake. But people who are unhealthy or have a weakened immune system tend to get infected with opportunistic pathogens. These are pathogens that otherwise wouldn't be able to overcome your immune system, but in cases where your immune system is actually destroyed or very damaged, such as HIV, or where you've had total body irradiation to, to destroy your bone marrow, their job of infecting you becomes much, much easier. The cells HIV target are specialised immune cells that actually have a role in recruiting the rest of the immune system response. This is to say they don't really get involved in actively fighting an infection, but they call over the big heavy guys and tell them who to beat up. As they target only a couple parts of the immune system, the progression of HIV is very particular. Three common infections of HIV conditions are PCP, which stands for Pneumonocystis canaria pneumonia, which I will just call PCP from now on, uh, Kaposky sarcoma, which isn't really a sarcoma, but still is an AIDS-related cancer, and the top of gun, maybe star of our last show, TB. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list, and there are many, many more different diseases that are associated with HIV and AIDS. On a quick side note, a person with HIV doesn't necessarily have AIDS. AIDS is a condition where parts of the immune cell response has dropped below a certain number. This means that the immune system is depleted enough to start allowing in these opportunistic infections. PCP was once thought to be a protozoa, but was later actually discovered to be a fungal infection. It causes symptoms by affecting the fibrotic tissue of the lung, thereby reducing your lung's capacity. And before effective treatment, it was actually the leading cause of AIDS-related deaths, and it still is the leading cause of AIDS-related deaths in areas where there isn't effective treatment. Kaposky sarcoma is an AIDS-related cancer. It's caused by an infection of the herpes virus, and it tends to infect about 10-20% of HIV-infected people. It was widely studied to try to help identify what the actual causative agent of AIDS was, and was termed AIDS rash for quite a long time. The identification of HIV as an actual pathogen and threat was mainly helped by the 1982 CDC report detailing a strange cluster of opportunistic infections. The term HIV was actually coined in 1986 by the International Commission for Taxonomy of Viruses and was a conglomeration of existing names for the virus. Right, now it's time to get technical. Viruses come in many different classes and it's all to do with how they pack their genetic information. Some use DNA and some use RNA. The DNA ones can have their DNA as either single-stranded or double-stranded, while the RNA ones can have their, their RNA as either single-stranded or double-stranded, and they can have it single-stranded where it's positive sense or single-stranded where it's negative sense, and so on. There also exist reverse transcriptase RNA viruses, which HIV is a member of. HIV is a positive strand, single-stranded 
RNA reverse transcriptase virus, put it into class 6 of the Baltimore scale. HIV has a protein shell which is covered by a membrane layer, which was taken from its last host cell. Through this, it pushes spike proteins which connect to the host receptor cell surface molecules. So how does HIV do what it does and how does it get into our cells? HIV is one of my favourite viruses, and this might sound a bit strange, but it's because it has such a really well understood life cycle and it's really interesting. So let's say HIV has gotten into a body. It floats around looking for something called a CD4 plus receptor. These are on the surface of some of your immune cells, the T helper cells, and some macrophages. To be a successful virus, HIV has to complete a number of steps, the first being attachment. This is where the viral particle actually attaches to the host cell. In doing this, it uses a protein called GP120, which is attached to the rest of the virus by GP41, which comes in a second. GP120 binds to the CD4 plus receptor on your cell surface. This binding of GP120 changes its conformational shape, which allows it to bind yet again to another co-receptor, either CCR5 or CXCR4. Binding to this co-receptor actually changes the shape of GP41, which unravels itself and harpoons itself into the cell surface membrane. Once it's done that, it folds itself back in itself through a process known as six-bundle helix formation. This change in shape brings the viral and the host cell so close that this causes the two membranes to actually fuse and allows the virus to get into the cell. Now the virus is actually inside your cell, it loses its protein shell. Its job now is just to replicate its genetic material. Its genome, which is single-stranded RNA, is essentially the same as mRNA. So it could be used as a template directly to transcribe proteins from, but HIV opts out of this and actually integrates itself into the host's DNA structure. HIV has brought along three different proteins with it. Reverse transcriptase, which takes the RNA and turns it into cDNA, and integrase, which takes the cDNA and puts it into the host DNA. From there, the host machinery starts to make viral DNA for the virus. From this DNA, viral proteins are made, and from the last protein that HIV brought with it, a protease, they are cut up into their active states. The virus now packs itself together and starts budding out from the cell and matures into an active and effective new viral particle and goes on to infect other cells with the same receptors on its surface. So what can be done to treat HIV? Well, we have a number of options. Some people have been cured effectively of HIV, but these are not viable treatments. They involve complete and total body irradiation of the bone marrow and replacement with a compatible donor. Current treatments are normally labelled under heart or highly active antiretroviral therapies. You'll remember from a moment ago that HIV has different lifestyle stages. At each of these stages, there exists a treatment to combat the virus. My favourite class are those that actually block viral entry. Infuvatide works by sitting in the place where GP41 will actually fold back in itself, blocking this mechanism of moving the two membranes closer together, thus stopping the viral entry into the cell. We also have nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which are like parts of single bits of DNA which go in there, but they block the machinery from working. We also have non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which aren't part of the DNA machinery, but still block the, the protein from working. Then we have protease inhibitors, and we have maturation inhibitors, and we have integrase inhibitors, and there's, just, there's so many different inhibitors, and they are active treatments for HIV. The thing I find most exciting about heart treatment is this. Currently, children are being born from HIV positive mothers and are not HIV positive themselves because of these effective treatments. And that's just fantastic. And it wouldn't be possible without all the brilliant, hardworking, thousands of dedicated scientists and people funding their work. That's a better world for everyone, I think. So that's a very brief look at the early history of HIV and some of the very cool molecular biology around it. Feel free to subscribe, like, and favourite this, and next time I'll be looking at cholera and the curious case of Dr. Pettenkoffer. I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for watching.